Jesus Plus Nothing, 100% natural, no additives. Andrew Farley's celebrating your freedom in Christ. Call in and ask your questions at 877-956-9566. That's toll free at 877-956-9566. Via satellite from Texas, it's Andrew Farley Live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Andrew Farley Live. This is Andrew Farley Live, this time from Crystal Beach uh, here in Fort Erie, Ontario. That's in Canada, if you don't know. Uh, spending the weekend, have a, had a fun-filled weekend, let me tell you. Started off with uh, being at the City Church in Batavia, New York, followed by Church on the Beach today, and sandwiched in between there, I was doing a, an amusement park event called Kingdom Bound. So it's three days of fun, lots of opportunity to teach and share and visit with people up in the uh, Buffalo, New York and Toronto, Canada area. But we are live now here from Fort Erie. We are live for the next hour, taking your calls. The number to call 877-956-9566. We got a few open lines. If you've never been on the program before and you've got a question I don't know, maybe it's about a scripture passage, something going on in your personal life, or maybe you've heard a sermon recently and you're not sure about it. Well, that's why we're here for the next hour. Again, that number toll-free across the United States and Canada, 877-956-9566. So, you know, uh, I was I was sharing uh, this with the folks here in Canada. This This idea of the new covenant is so rarely taught. I mean, you know, some folks, we, we've never heard a sermon in our entire lives about the new covenant. What is the new covenant? What makes it such a big deal? Why is it better than the old covenant? Well, you know, the book of Hebrews, which is, by the way, I mean, it's it's one of the least studied books in the New Testament. Christians, we never seem to get around to study in Hebrews for some reason, but right there in the middle of Hebrews, you got to a fantastic uh, summation of what this new covenant is. It says, it says that God puts his desires, he etches them, he inscribes them on our hearts and our minds, and then he forgives our sins forever, no matter what. Uh, so you got total forgiveness, you got God's desires, basically he cleans house and he moves in Christ in you giving you his desires on your heart and mind. That's what the new covenant's really all about. But people, uh, you know, we even get confused about the beginning of the new covenant. When did it start? Well, it doesn't start uh, in Matthew chapter 1. That's not really the beginning of the New Testament era. The new covenant, the New Testament, doesn't begin with Matthew 1, baby Jesus in a manger. It really begins at the cross. The, the death of Christ is the beginning of the new covenant. Now, why is that so important? Well, Hebrews 9 tells us this. It says that Christ's death, you know, there has to be a, a death for a covenant to go into effect. And uh, so, you, you know, it's important because you look at the teachings of Jesus and sometimes he's telling people, you know, cut off your hand, pluck out your eye, be perfect, sell everything. Now, if that's not law, I don't know what law is. In fact, that is law 2.0. I've been calling it Moses, Moses 2.0. Good luck with that. You can't pull it off. You can't live it. And that's why the rich man went away sad. And the Pharisees, they went away mad. And Jesus' mission was accomplished. He was putting the nails in the coffin, showing them the impossibility of law-based living. The new covenant is then introduced through his death, not his birth, but through his death, the new way of grace is introduced. And then against the backdrop of all that attempted self-improvement, against the backdrop of all that trying and failing, they can begin to see their need for grace, their need for the finished work of Jesus Christ. When did the new covenant begin? It began at the death of Christ, not at the birth of Christ. And that can make all the difference in understanding those impossible teachings of Jesus. As you're listening right now, you probably got both eyeballs in your sockets there, don't you? So you haven't plucked out your eyes, but you know your eyes cause you to sin. 
why haven't you plucked them out? I mean, Jesus said to. So then we're stuck believing, well, you know, did Jesus really mean it? Maybe we water it down and say, oh, he didn't really mean it. Or the other alternative is to put it in context. It was before the cross. It was aimed at Jews. It was aimed at prideful people who thought they could do self-improvement. And so Jesus shows them the one thing they can't do in order to cause despair, in order to cause a need for grace. And so Jesus Christ introduces the new covenant through his death. Beautiful stuff. The new covenant is critical. It needs to be shouted from the rooftops across the United States, across Canada, and across the world. And that's why we're doing our part here. Well, let's go out to Robert in Tennessee and talk about law and grace. Hey, Robert, you're on the air. Andrew, how you doing? I've been trying to get a hold of you for months. Well, you uh, got me, brother. Go for it. Well, it's kind of exciting. I want to tell you, and this may take a little bit. I hope I don't run over a lot of time, but I want to tell you, um, I started debating some friends of mine that are obeying the Torah about mm -hmm. six or seven months ago. And well, that sounds I've like heard, fun. Well, it has been exciting because it's changed my life. Mm -hmm. Part of part of the problem with people in church, and I hope there's a lot of people listening, the Bible says to study yourself to show yourself approved. Mm -hmm. um, we sit under pastors and preachers and teachers, and yes, God gave them for the perfecting of the saints. But it is our responsibility. God gave dominion to man, and it's our responsibility to lead our household, and we haven't been doing it. That's the reason the church has no power today, mm. because we're not following God's Word. And I've noticed that in my own church. Sexual sin has been rampant through our church, through teenagers and even adults, for years. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's always been the same motion. Come up, ask God to forgive you, go to the altar, get hands laid on you, your life's going to change. Mm -hmm. But it never changed anyone. Yeah, it's like, a, it's, the, it's like a revolving door, isn't it? Well, exactly. And, but when I started studying the, the debate of law and grace with these friends of mine, uh, which the way they said it, they were in total legalism. It was a mm -hmm. performance-based system like the Old Covenant. Mm -hmm. And it changed my life because when I started seeing that the grace of God is what empowers us to say no to sin, mm -hmm. that's what changed me. Right. And But that doesn't mean, and I'm, I disagree with you on a couple of things. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean I think you're a heretic or anything like that. <laughs> Your okay. teaching is the best teaching I have ever seen on law and grace. Mm -hmm. Thank uh, you. A couple of the things that I disagree with in your video, The Naked Gospel, mm -hmm. you said that every sin is deliberate. Well, that's not true. Mm -hmm. uh, and the reason I say that is because in the Old Covenant, they had specific sacrifices for unintentional sins. Mm -hmm. uh, God made it very plain that People sin unintentionally. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 20, 10, 26 talks about if we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, mm -hmm. well, what is that? What truth is he talking about? Mm -hmm. He's talking about knowing what sin is. Okay. And if you know what, if you know what sin is, what is sin? Sin is the transgression of the law. Okay. Now, well, Robert, uh, hey, hey, Robert, you got a you got a lot going on here. So let me interject um, because, uh, you know, first of all, in the Old Testament to sin accidentally, the reason that can exist in the Old Testament is because there were 613 flavors of sin. And so the reason that I think that such a thing existed in the Old Testament is because, quite frankly, the Israelites couldn't all memorize 613 regulations and make sure that they hadn't missed one. So there was lots of accidental accidental sinning in the Old Testament. As far as the reason that I say you don't uh, sin without your will involved uh, under the New Testament, 
because then you end up with a bunch of Christians that say, well, you know, it's not my fault. It was just an accidental sin. My will wasn't involved. And uh, then then we're telling people there's no choice, like uh, that the Holy Spirit doesn't bring an awareness of the right thing to do in the moment. And uh, so they just had no clue. And so, you know, it's, it's not even their fault because God didn't get involved and he didn't show them the right thing. And so that's my point in saying all that. And, and, you know, uh, we can, we can disagree on that, but I think the thrust of your call here is to talk about law and grace. And did you have a question for me on that? Yeah, I wanted to, um, I'm going to, I'm going to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. I have. I'm seeing something, and I wish I could get a different number to call you back later if that's possible. Mm -hmm. Because I want to ask you some more questions. I don't have time uh, to do that on there. I don't know if that's possible, if one of your guys can do that. or Sure. uh, But one thing that I am starting to see is that uh, how do you take into account – now, I agree 100% that we are in the new covenant. Uh-huh. We're not under the law. Mm-hmm. Christ died so that the law could be filled in us, mm-hmm. not by us. Okay. But Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Mm-hmm. The Roman Catholic Church is the one that changed the, um, and I've got, Hey, hey, Robert, I'm sorry, brother, but just uh, if you've got a question, hit me with it. Uh, okay. You know, we, we don't we, we got other folks on the line here. OK, yeah. I'm sorry. That's are all right. We still supposed to honor mm-hmm. because we Israel. Now we are Israel. Mm-hmm. Are we supposed to still honor the Sabbath on Saturday and okay. not Sunday? OK. All right. Well, cool. Well, thanks for your call. Uh, hang on the line there and I'll address that the best I can. And we'll be sure to get you some some contact information so that you can uh, follow up with me. We'll go deeper as well uh, in the future if you want to reach out to me. So that was Robert. And uh, his question is about the uh, Sabbath and our role regarding the law. So uh, the issue is, is that, first of all, we need to see that we Christians are dead to the law. Romans 7 says we died to the law so that uh, we might live for God. So if you want to live for God, it starts by dying to the law. Now, the Sabbath is not an exception to that. You are dead to the Sabbath. In fact, if you're listening right now and you don't have Jewish blood flowing through your veins, then God calls you a Gentile. And a Gentile was never even given the law. And a Gentile was never even given the Sabbath. So it is absolutely off the charts uh, crazy talk, in a sense, for us Christians here on the west side of the Atlantic, thousands of miles from Israel, to be talking about keeping the Sabbath, which is Friday night to Saturday sundown. Colossians chapter 2 challenges anybody who would try to push that on Christians. Colossians tells us that the Sabbath was nothing but a mere shadow, a shadow of things to come, and that the reality is Christ. Well, how was the Sabbath a shadow? Because for thousands of years, Jews would relax. They would take a break. They would rest on a single day each week. And that was a shadow or a picture or a symbol of us spiritually today resting in Christ. We rest in the finished work of Christ because Christ did it all. And all we can do is say by faith, we say, wow, and we say, thank you. And we relax in what Christ has done for us. So the reality is Christ and the Sabbath was nothing but a symbol, a shadow. And we are dead to the law and we are dead to the Sabbath. And instead, we find our spiritual rest in Jesus. And that's for every day. We rest in him every single day. And so when Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Of course, that's what Robert was quoting. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. He's not talking about 613 commands in the Old Testament. He tells us what his commandments are. In fact, we can read them in the New Testament. We can read them in 1 John. 1 John says, these are his commands to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and to love others 
even as he has loved us. And so he also says in 1 John that these commands are not burdensome. Now imagine if it was 600 and some commands, that would be burdensome, wouldn't it? But the, it's not burdensome. Under the new covenant of God's grace, his commands are believe in Jesus and love others as you're soaking in the love of God. So not every time we see the word commands in the Bible is it referring to the Old Testament law. Sometimes it's referring to what is written on our hearts today on this side of the cross. We've got Jesus Christ living in us and he has written his commands of belief in Jesus and loving others. That's what he's written on our hearts. Well, thanks for your call, Robert. I hope that's helpful to you and feel free to reach out if you've got some further questions. Well, let's go out to Arlington, Texas, and we'll talk to Michael. Hey, Michael. Hi, Angie. Hey, what's on your mind? Yeah, I was reading Deuteronomy, and one scripture that came to me, I've often heard in church that I believe is misinterpreted, and I want to know your opinions on it. It's uh, Deuteronomy 32 and 39 when it says, See now that I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any can leave me out of my hand. So what does this mean when he says, I kill, I make alive? What does that really refer to? Yeah, well, you know, in the Old Testament time period, and that's what we're talking about when we refer to a Deuteronomy, I mean, sometimes God was sending Israel into military battle. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes God was engaging in protecting Israel. And we say, why would he do that? And, you know, the atheists out there will grab a, a story out of the Old right. Testament and say, look how cruel, look how militant, look how you know, your God is in the Old Testament. Well, he is protecting Israel from people who would kill Israelites. I mean, there's going to be death anyway. And so these people are going to kill the lineage and the heritage of Jesus. And so in order to protect Jesus and his family line, in order to protect God's chosen people, sometimes in the Old Testament, God makes these decisions to protect military and he sends Israel out and he blesses them in that. And so when we read in Deuteronomy 32 verse 39 about Jesus or God putting to death and bringing to life, the real context is, hey, look, see, there's no other gods out there. I'm the one calling the shots here. I'm the one who allows people to live. I'm the one that breathes the breath of life into Adam and gets this thing started. I'm the one who carries people off to heaven. I'm the, I'm the giver of life. And so there's an Old Testament context to this passage, but there's a New Testament application in that God is God and he runs the universe and he is awesome. Okay, well, no, that makes a lot of sense, because I've always, you know, heard when they use I kill, that mean that God is the author of murder and all of that. Like, no, I don't think that's what he's saying. Right. Yeah, I mean, to, to, to be extra clear here, I mean, anybody that's going to tell you that God runs around killing people today, uh, you know, will remember that the purpose of the cross was that when the... Right. When the Son of Man is lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself, and his desire is that none perish, but all believe. And so God did not send Jesus into the world to judge the world, but to save it. And so now the floodgates have been opened and the gospel is unleashed on every nation. And God's desire is to save anyone and everyone that will call upon his name. So God is not busy killing people. God is busy saving people. Whosoever will respond, that's who he wants to save. Okay, and I guess it goes along with the scripture when they ask, you know, should we command fire down from heaven and say, well, you don't know a spirit you're talking to, I come to save them and not mm -hmm. destroy them. So every time I look at this scripture, I kind of feel like that's what a lot of churches do. They all get fire from heaven and it's kind of playing that scripture that he didn't come to destroy, come to save. But thanks, that really helped me a lot. I know I'm reading the Old Testament, but I was just trying to see in line of the New Testament, how does that apply? Yeah, well, absolutely. I appreciate your call. And I mean, just to wrap up there, you're quoting out of Luke chapter nine. And that was James and John who said that it wasn't Jesus. 
James and John, who were at that time pretty clueless, I mean, they needed Pentecost, they needed the Spirit in them, they needed true revelation, but at the time, they turned to Jesus, and they're like, hey, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven to destroy them? Well, that's not Jesus' idea. That's some, some disciples who really don't know what they're talking about. I mean, remember that Peter takes a sword out and lops some guy's ears off. <laughs> and uh, he, after he lops his ear off, you know, Jesus restores it, saying, we're not about that. We're not doing that. That's not our purpose. So don't let James and John and their clueless idea in Luke 9, let, don't let that confuse you. Uh, God's not interested in killing. He's interested in saving. All right. Well, thanks for your call, brother, and uh, you call any time. Well, folks, I uh, want to remind you that if you're interested in supporting the broadcast, uh, you can go to Church Without Religion. That is churchwithoutreligion.com. You can click on our giving tab. We've had some folks that are stepping up to the plate. Notice that the giving has been really good and encouraging to me personally. Uh, you know, we're at about 85% now. If you would like to help us get fully funded, uh, we sure could use that help. You can go to churchwithoutreligion.com. You can become a regular giver. Maybe you're interested in giving just 20 bucks a month or 50 bucks a month or whatever it might be. If we're part of your day or part of your week and you look to us for encouragement, if you enjoy the broadcast and you want to see it grow and expand, we sure could use your help. Uh, consider a small gift, a regular gift. Go to churchwithoutreligion.com and you can click on the giving tab there. Well, let's go ahead out to uh, my good friend Chris in Virginia. Hey, Chris, you're on the air. Hey, good friend Andrew. I have two questions for you today. The first one is Luke chapter 19, mm -hmm. uh, the parable of the Minas. Uh, last week I was listening to your sermon about what's missing from the Bible, and you were saying that based on the parable of the vineyard workers, you know how everyone gets the same reward. And then you see here in this parable of the minas, you see the guy who produced 10 minas, he gets 10 cities, and the guy who produced 5 minas gets 5 cities, and I wanted to ask your interpretation of that. Yeah, well, I don't think that it's about a bunch of cities in heaven. I don't think that it's about a bunch of cities, I mean, on earth that we're going to rule over in a future world. I know that some people teach that, but quite frankly, with the millions and maybe billions of Christians throughout history, we're going to run out of cities quick. <laughs> so, so um, yeah, I think the theme of this, the reason that cities comes up is because there's a ruler here with servants and the ruler in this parable. Remember that it is a parable. This ruler is ruler over many cities. And so he's got these servants. And the theme here is, look. Um, if I, if I give you something to invest, why are you burying it in the ground? You're not going to get any return from that. So it looks like I can't trust you with bigger jobs. I can't trust you with bigger responsibilities because, um, you're just taking what you have and you're squandering it. So now what is that a picture or a symbol of? Well, it's a picture or a symbol of the gospel itself. Every Christian, every servant of the Lord, every child of God has received the gospel message. We've understood it on some level, at least on a basic level. And so then the question is, are we going to invest in the gospel and get a personal and communal return from that? Are we going to invest in the gospel and, and enjoy the freedom we have in Christ and enjoy the love of God and enjoy the fruit of the spirit and enjoy uh, communing with other people and ministering to them in small ways or big ways or any ways? Are we going to invest in the gospel and get a return from it? Or are we going to bury the gospel in the sand and just forget about it and not enjoy the fact that God has the market cornered on everything fulfilling? And so the gospel can give us a tremendous return in our personal lives, and that's right now. And so as, as I invest in the gospel, what I find is, is that, uh, well, I'm growing spiritually. I'm growing in the knowledge of Jesus. I'm growing in the knowledge of his grace. And it's going to be intuitive and rational and normal for the God of the universe 
to set me up with some t-ball action. Let me explain what I mean by <laughs> t-ball. I get this from a good friend of mine, Mike Daniel, but Mike Daniel says, hey, you know, walking with God is like playing t-ball. I mean, t- in t-ball, they uh, set the ball up on the tee there for you. And then they put the bat in your hand. This is when you're a little kid, right? I mean, they set the ball up there on the tee, and then they put the bat in your hand, and you got three strikes at it. I mean, give me a break. Three strikes at a ball that's standing still, sitting on a tee. All right, ready, go. And suddenly there's a plunk, and that ball goes flying, and everybody's clapping, and you're running around the baseball diamond. Well, you know, God's setting everything up just like that. And we get to participate But God has prepared in advance the works so that all we do is wake up and walk in them. And uh, so the bottom line is, yes, there's growth. And yes, God trusts us with ministry opportunities and God trusts us. But there's a role we play in investing in the gospel. Instead of burying it in the ground, we get a return on the gospel when we fix our eyes on Jesus and really get to know his love and grace. Okay, yeah, I played played t-ball as a kid, and I was an all-star in t-ball. Just a little fun fact about me there. All right, man. The second question I have for you is 1 John 5.16. Where John says, if you see a brother who commits a sin that does not lead to death, you shall ask, and God shall give him life. Mm -hmm. So what sticks out to me there is if he's asking, if the person who's praying is asking for God to give him life, that kind of implies that he doesn't previously have life, as if he's not yet a believer. Mm -hmm. Like, the sin that leads to death for me is, like, stubborn, uh, you know, refusal to believe in Jesus as as Savior. So the the way it sounds to me is, as long as the person isn't like digging their heels in in complete rebellion and refusal to believe in Jesus, and your prayers can actually lead that person uh, closer to him. Is that true? Yeah. I mean, first of all, you know, let's say what this is not saying. For for decades, maybe centuries, people have tried to say uh, that this is about suicide or something. But the reality is, is that the sin that's leading to death the only sin that leads to spiritual death, the only sin that, you know, you really can't uh, pray and ask God to work with people on. God's not going to make people into robots. So the sin is the sin of unbelief, unbelief in the gospel, rejecting the gospel message. That is the sin that leads to death. And so uh, there's many other sins that believers commit. But it's impossible for you and I, for example, we can't commit the sin that leads to death because, Chris, we've already believed. And so we we are now uh, in Christ and we're not going to commit the sin that leads to death because we believe in Jesus. So, uh, you know, we can pray for people who are struggling, their believers, their brothers and sisters in Christ. And we can say, God, you know, uh, we just ask that you would minister to them and work in their hearts because you live in them and show them the truth and open up the scriptures to them and help them see your love and help them see their identity in Christ and help them see your grace. And so by doing that, Uh, We're praying that God would uh, reveal his life and share his life and the benefit of his life to them because they are already believers and Christ lives in them. So bottom line, Chris, this passage is saying you can't pray people into heaven. You can't pray that somebody is going to just believe because God won't won't force his way into people's lives. There is a sin that leads to death. And we can't pray people out of that. They have to choose the gospel. They have to respond to the heart of God. But when it comes to our brothers and sisters in Christ, we certainly can pray that God will minister to them. Paul prayed that all the time. He prayed that the eyes of our hearts would be opened, that we would see the gospel for its fullness and what it means to have Christ living in us. And in that way, God gives us life and ministers to us and works through us and all those things because he already lives in us. Okay, so when Paul had, or John had said a few verses earlier, he who does not have the Son does not have life, he who has the Son has life. So you're saying that when you pray, God is giving that person like additional revelation and clarification on what really that life 
entails? What does it mean to know Jesus? Is that right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, we all know that, for example, uh, we have eternal salvation right now as Christians, but we also get saved from the world. We get saved from certain struggles. We get saved from the flesh. We get saved from old, dirty thinking that we used to have. So salvation has two meanings. It's a it's an eternal salvation that's locked in. It's permanent. And it's also a daily salvation that we wake up and say, thank you, God, for saving me from that. And thank you, God, for saving me from this. And so in the same way, God has given his life to us. Sure, that's what salvation is. He gave you and me the life of Christ. But also, you know, every day there is a giving of his life, if you want to call it that. Uh, there's a sharing of his life. It, it would be called the fruit of the spirit. And so uh, we participate in the life of God. We participate in God's divine nature and he shares his spirit with us and we reap a benefit from that. And so, yeah, I think that's what this passage is talking about. And, uh, you know, that's the way that God shares himself with us on a daily basis. And that's how we pray for other believers who are struggling. Okay. Well, thanks as always for your time and for your ministry. Love having you as a brother. Thank you so much for everything. And you have a great week. All right. You too, Chris. Call again, brother. Okay, folks, uh, we've got, uh, well, we're only halfway through. Uh, we got plenty of time. We got a couple open lines. If you want to jump in and uh, ask your question, the number to call, 877-956-9566. You're listening to Andrew Farley Live. This is Andrew Farley. We're live for the next, oh, 20 minutes or so. And so there's still time for you to hop in. And if you want to get the archives of our program, uh, of course, you can go to Church Without Religion. That's churchwithoutreligion.com. You can click on the media tab, and we have all of our programs archived there for you. If you're interested in following up, getting a deeper understanding of this grace of God, well, I recommend uh, The Naked Gospel or God Without Religion, two books that will take you deeper. Uh, dozens and dozens of chapters with loads of scripture throughout that will help you journey to the center of of God's grace and understand him better. Again, that's the naked gospel and God without religion. Both of those you can get on Amazon. Well, let's go ahead out and uh, go talk with Joe listening in Kansas City. Hey, Joe, what's on your mind? Hi. I, I'm really enjoying your program. I've called in before and I'm really glad I have satellite radio where I found you because I... As I've as talked about before, I've always been, up until listening to your program, I've always been concerned about uh, whether or not I was really a Christian because I, my lifestyle didn't really reflect that very well. Mm -hmm. So you explained about how Christ died for all our sins uh, because when he was on the cross, there were all future tense sins. And there's not some arbitrary line in the sand where we we sin up to that point, and then we we exhausted uh, our forgiveness. My yeah, question that, is now. Yeah. That, uh, oh well, I was just going to say to yeah, Joe, that, uh, for for the audience then that's listening. Yeah, it's a, a beautiful point that you're recapping for us uh, from our previous call. The fact is is that all of our sins were in the future when Christ died. And so Christians are really totally forgiven people. God looked down the timeline of your sins at your past sins, your present sins, and even your future sins, and he took them all away. And so that's why Christians don't have to wait and beg and plead and hope and, and, and wait for this forgiveness from God. God is not swooping down out of heaven to zap us with a new portion of forgiveness and cleansing every day. Instead, it was the blood of Jesus that forgave us once for all. And that's what the book of Hebrews says. It says that we are forgiven once for all, not again and again, not over and over and over in little portions. If that were the case, that's what the Judaism was. That's what the law was. That's what animal blood did. But the blood of Jesus Christ was greater than that blood. The blood of Jesus Christ was greater than the Old Testament sacrifices. And so that's why Hebrews says by one offering, 
by one offering he has made us perfectly cleansed forever. And that's what you're referring to, and that's what we need to celebrate in Jesus Christ. So my follow-up question on that, the reason I call today is, um, if we have uh, some people call it the Holy Spirit, some uh, people call it Christ and dwelling in us, uh, but whichever label you want to put on it, why do we even sin at all uh, if we've got Christ living in us? Mm, great, great question, Joe. So glad you asked that. All right, so... You know, we are more than spirit. Uh, we got to look at what we are as humans. We have a spirit and we have a soul and we have a body. Now, many people don't realize that. They try to teach that we're made up of two parts. They say, well, we've got a body and a spirit, or they say we've got a body and a soul. Well, we're actually three parts. If you look in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 23, and you also look in Hebrews, you see that we are comprised of three parts, body, soul, and spirit. And so when we come to salvation, when we receive the life of Christ, the spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, comes to live in our spirit. He lives at the core of our being. And so the Bible says anyone who has received the Lord becomes one spirit with him. Our spirit is joined to his spirit. He lives in us and we live in him. And this is on the spirit level. Now, there's another level. It's called the soul. And that's where I think and that's where I feel and that's where I choose. And so sometimes I don't think like a child of God. Sometimes I don't feel like a child of God, and certainly sometimes I don't choose things like a child of God should choose. And so we are growing. Why, why, why is that? Because uh, until we get to heaven, we're always right. going to have that soulish, earthly sin nature in us? Well, yeah, the best way to explain it is that we are always in our soul going to experience the renewing of the mind. We've got old thoughts, old habits, old thinking, and we've got temptation coming into the soul. That temptation is coming into the soul from the world and from the power of sin and from the enemy. Those fiery darts are coming at our soul. And so sometimes we don't live from the spirit. Sometimes we choose to live like the world instead of living from our core. And so let me explain. This is so beautiful and so important that when we are living the Christian life, we are living from our core. We are being who we really are. When we choose what God wants, we are also choosing what we really want. We have a new heart, a new spirit, a new core. We are new creations. We are a new self with a new nature. And so when we choose Christ, we are choosing from our core. But when we choose sin, we are choosing from outside of our core. We are choosing to live like the world because our five senses have captured some temptation and we fall for it and we're duped and we choose sin. And then we're sitting there regretting it, saying, why did I do it? Why did I do it? Why did I do the very thing that I don't really want to do? And so it's beautiful because Christians don't really want to sin at the core. Our new nature, our new heart, our new spirit does not want to sin, but our thinking is catching up to this and we're growing in the soul. And so in many ways we get duped and tricked and deceived into doing the very thing that we don't really want to do. But all the while, Christ lives in us, and all the while, we are a new creation. And all the while, we wish we hadn't done it. And if we learn this in advance next time, then we can actually choose, wait a minute, wait just a minute. That thought is not coming from me. That thought is not coming from my heart. That thought is not coming from my spirit. And I don't want anything to do with it. I'm going to live from the new core that God gave me. Um, if it's any consolation to you, your your message of grace 
is actually making me sin less. Yep. Uh, when I when I get thinking about sin at times, I feel like I might as well be climbing up the ladder and spitting in Jesus' face. And yeah. it just yeah. chokes me up when I think about what he went through and then I go and and then I go and spit in his face by sinning yeah. anyhow. Well, Joe, you described it to a T. I hear it over and over and over again. And here's the reason, because grace works. I mean, God's not an idiot. God knows what he's doing. God is a genius. And so when he puts us under grace, he knows that the very thing that Titus says, Paul writes uh, and he says, the grace of God teaches us to say no to sin. And so we shouldn't be surprised that uh, the, this gospel of grace is going to motivate us to sin less, not sin more. And that's why it just, you know, baffles me to no end when people try to say that we need less grace or we need a balance of grace and law and all that stuff. All it does under law is sin is excited. Sin is excited under law. And uh, we're free from sin under grace. And so that's why Paul says, apart from law, sin is dead. So when people invite us to a life of law, they invite us to a life of sin. They don't even realize yeah, it. Because, uh, because if, you know, people don't take pleasure in doing legal stuff. They take, with our twisted sin nature, we take pleasure in doing what, or what is illegal, that's legal. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so, you know, I mean, it's weird, but yeah, the more legalistic you make it, the more that we're going to want to do it. That's right. So what the, the most accurate uh, term for our struggle is that we struggle with the flesh. And so the flesh is going to want the law, but what's so sad is that when we put ourselves under the law, the flesh just gets excited. And so the answer is to get out from under the law, get under the grace of God, and let the heart of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God, let the grace of God teach us to say no to sin, and it'll work every single time. Thanks, Joe, for your call. Thank you. All right, all right brother. Well, that was a great call, and it's just another reminder, isn't it? I mean... The folks out there who are saying you can have too much grace, it's like saying you can have too much Jesus. Having too much grace is like you can say you're having too much of the love of God. You're having too much victory over sin. I mean, if grace gives us victory over sin, then how can we have too much grace? Having too much grace is like saying we can have too much victory. It doesn't make any sense at all. How about we put all our stock in Jesus Christ and announce that he's doing a great job running the universe and that he can run my life too. Apparently, all we need is him. Well, uh, let's go ahead out to uh, Oklahoma and we'll talk with Jeff. Hey, Jeff, what's going on? Are you there, Jeff? Jeff, can you hear me? Yes, Hello? sir, I got you now. Oh, thank God, thank God. Uh, I, I've... Uh... Um, my question is about uh, the unpardonable sin, uh, basically because of uh, the way I raised myself. Uh, mm -hmm. um, I'm a believer in Christ. Uh, I read my Bible. I do the best I can every day. But to give you a short background, I, uh, you know, for years and years, you know, I, I denied the Lord completely. You know, mm -hmm. I was into the Luciferian way of life. Uh, I was into much evil and hate and destruction and. Mm -hmm. And then one day I met a lady and became married. And so I've, I've spent many years now, you know, reading the Bible and studying and, you know, trying to do the best I can. But I'm concerned about that, that sin, you know, as, uh, you know, because I denied the Lord and the Holy Spirit for so long. Mm -hmm. And, uh, um, do you believe and, uh, in him now? Oh, so, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My life has changed so dramatically. It's, it's crazy. I mean, I haven't had the, uh, you know, the super spiritual experiences that I hear a lot of other people go through, but it's still, it's, it's changed dramatically and I believe for the better, but I'm just wondering, you know, I mean, there was a well, time in my life where, uh, yeah. you know, for 30 years where I was, mm -hmm. you know, the, completely the opposite. And I always what? believed in a God right. and in Satan. I just denied God in his ways for so long. 
Okay, you know, well, I've, I've Jeff, learned that, uh, uh, you know, that, you know, I learned that was just a trick, you know. Yeah, for the sake of time, I'm going to have to jump in, and we're almost at the end of the program, but I want to really devote some serious time to your question here. First of all, Jeff, if you have gone from a place of, you know, originally not really uh, thinking much about Jesus and neglecting him and living in a life of sin, and then now you're in a place of believing in him and trusting in him, let me tell you, that is super spiritual. You talked about a super spiritual experience that others have had. Well, to me, uh, your testimony right there is indeed super spiritual. So don't put any stock in comparing your life with anybody else's life. Uh, as folks uh, try to, you know, tell us about the bells and whistles that they've experienced, and we get all googly-eyed about all that, and then we wish that God had done something similar. Well, your testimony in your life is one of God carrying you from a place of unbelief to a place of belief in him. And it sounds like you got your feet on solid ground now. And the saving of your spirit, the saving of your life, the fact that you have Christ living in you is the biggest miracle, the biggest thing that any human being can experience. Now, when it comes to the unpardonable sin, the unpardonable sin is rejecting the gospel. Now, you are in a place of belief. You believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. You believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. You believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so you have gone from a place of unbelief to belief. In other words, you've been saved. You've responded to the gospel. You've called upon the name of the Lord. And so now uh, you don't even have to worry about the unpardonable sin. The only sin that people go to hell for is the sin of unbelief. But you've decided to believe. And so what the enemy is doing with you, Jeff, is saying, but wait a minute, Jeff, don't you remember all those years? Come on, Jeff. It was 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. It was so very many, many, many sins, Jeff. Well, the answer to that is Jesus died for all those sins. Jesus took away all those sins. Jesus forgave those sins. Jesus remembers those sins no more. See, the enemy wants you to be impressed with the size and quantity of your sins. And so the question is, are you impressed with the size of your sins or are you impressed with the size of your Savior? Which is it? Because it needs to be your Savior that you're impressed with. And so the enemy would have you look back and run the race of life, running this race backwards, obsessed with your track record looking at your past steps and where you've been and oh my 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 so how many mistakes have I made and have I made one too many well remember that the way the Christian life is lived is by turning forward looking out in front of you like any professional runner we look out way ahead and we fix our eyes on the Son of God. We fix our eyes on Jesus Christ himself and we let go of everything behind us. The grace of God has got us covered. Jesus didn't die for some of your sins. He died for all of your sins. He saw every single one of them before the foundation of the world. And his plan was to take them away through the cross and through the blood of Jesus. So if you have received Jesus Christ and if you are relying on his finished work, Jeff, then you are a forgiven person. And the unpardonable sin is impossible for you to commit because the unpardonable sin is unbelief in Jesus. And you now, my friend, you stand firm as a believer in him. And so no one can snatch you out of his hand. And, it, and he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. In fact, he tells us in the book of Hebrews, he says that he is able to save you completely because he always lives to intercede for you and that is for any sin imaginable he always lives to intercede for you so get this now the length the duration the security of your salvation is wrapped up in the length of Jesus's life he is able to save you completely why because he always lives he always lives to intercede for you and so it is about his life it's not about the quality of your living so does that help? Period. To the belief, period. 
Absolutely. Told Jesus, that was that was my grace point. That That's was right. What saved me. You That's, crossed over. You crossed right over on, from right death on. to life. That's right. That's yeah, right. That's what I was looking for. From death to life. That, thank you. I just I don't know why I have a problem with that. I know this already, but I just it's like I need mm-hmm. constant re- for, re- re- reminding of it. You know, I yep. don't know why. Well, I'll tell you why, because you got an accuser. There is an accuser that hates every child of God, and the accuser is the biggest nagger on the planet, and he will feed your mind error about your past and try to pull out some file drawer full of sins. But Jesus Christ has destroyed your your sin record. He remembers your sins no more. Thank you, Andrew. All right, brother. Love you. You call again anytime. Folks, uh, it's fun to talk about Jesus, isn't it? It's fun to put the focus where the focus needs to be. Not on the size and quantity of our mess-ups, but on the size of the work of Jesus Christ. Because the work worked. When he said it's finished, he really meant it. And we need to take that for ourselves and celebrate it. And celebrate it from the rooftops and share with others this incredible news. Well, let's go ahead out to uh, Derek, listening in Virginia, where I'm originally from. Hey, Derek, you're on the air. Hello, sir. I, uh, real quick, my question has to do with the impeccability of Jesus, whether he was able to sin when tempted. From my mm-hmm. background, I had always understood that he could have given in when he was tempted, because why would it be called a temptation if not? But I would argue with people who say, well, God can't be tempted from James 1, and I would say, but he was both God and man. Anyway, I heard another grace teacher say that to say that would be a dis- uh, Christ dishonoring doctrine. And I can't, I couldn't recall whether he elaborated, but I, I've begun to reconsider, but wanted to call because I was interested in your view. Sure. Well, thanks for your call, uh, brother. We're able to squeeze it in in here right at the end of the uh, broadcast, the program here. And so I'll address that as we close out. You know, Hebrews chapter 4, it says, We do not have a high priest who's unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. And so I think it's it's very important to be scripturally accurate on this. We got to remember that uh, Jesus Christ is Jesus Christ. He was and is God. He's part of the Trinity. He is fully God, and yet at that time he was fully man. And so he could be tempted, but how? Well, tempted through his five senses tempted through his humanity and it wasn't fake it wasn't god play acting it wasn't jesus pretending to be tempted Uh, he really was experiencing all of the possibility of sinning and yet he never sinned why did he not sin well even though he was fully man he was also fully god and so he walked in something that no one else had ever walked in. He walked in total trust and total dependency. He was wired from the ground up. He is built from the ground up to trust in his father. And that's what he modeled for us, a total dependency on someone else. I don't do anything except what I see the father doing. If you've seen the father, then you've, if you've seen me, you've seen the father. And so... We have to realize that Jesus modeled the very same dependent life that we now have in depending on Jesus. For more information on Andrew's books, please visit andrewfarley.org. That's andrewfarley.org. Join us every week at this time as we invite you to celebrate the freedom of God's grace. Goodbye, everybody.